So you always want to be prepared to... To set goals. To be really disruptive. Diversity is fundamental. It is just trusting those super strengths. To recover from those failures and, and learn from them. Humility looks like the softest word, but it's kind of the hardest. We ourselves are in beta mode. Life goes on. Sporting Edge, inside the mind of champions. My name's Jeremy Snape and welcome to my podcast, taking you inside the mind of champions. During my 19-year career as a professional and international cricketer, I had so many examples where my mindset was responsible for me winning, but equally so many examples where my mindset was responsible for me losing. Yet no one seemed to be talking about it, let alone coaching it. So I studied a master's degree in sports psychology and then had a chance to work with some of the biggest names in sport. My first role was at the Indian Premier League with the legendary Australian cricketer Shane Warne, trying to build a team from scratch where the Indian billionaires had bought these players in an auction. We had the cheapest team at 67 million US dollars and we managed to win that inaugural IPL, which was an amazing fairy tale. That led me on to work with the South African cricket team as they went from number four to number one in the world and work with the likes of Graham Smith, A.B. de Villiers, Hashim Amla and Dale Steyn. Then I had a chance to work with the Sri Lankan cricket team as they went through another World Cup cycle. I got a call from Eddie Jones with England Rugby to support them as he made the massive transformation of being knocked out early in their own backyard at the World Cup to go on in through to the World Cup final. So I worked with Eddie for the first 18 months of his tenure. And then I've also been very privileged to support the League Managers Association with all the Premier League and lower division managers in the UK and developing their leadership and management content. And that's given me an amazing privilege to meet the likes of Sir Alex Ferguson, Jose Mourinho, Pep Guardiola and many of their peers. So the chance to work with and support those people has been incredible. Over the last decade, I've been able to use this trusted access to conduct a unique research project, interviewing hundreds of the world-class thinkers and performers from the worlds of elite sport, the performing arts, the military, as well as experts in business strategy, well-being and neuroscience. Along with my team of psychologists and learning experts at Sporting Edge, we translate these human stories of success and failure from the top 1% into digital resources that can support thousands of executives around the world. So in this podcast series, Inside the Mind of Champions, you'll hear from world-class thinkers and performers, and I'll deconstruct their secrets so we can turn it into practical strategies to help you thrive. In today's episode, we're going to tackle the subject of goal setting and motivation. We all seem to set goals, but to struggle to live up to that, to our own hopes. We'll be hearing from international sports stars, Olympic coaches and neuroscientists to give you a toolkit to turn your goals into results. My passion is to make this content widely accessible, so I've been asking for questions across my social platforms and the first question around this topic comes from Mark. Hi Jeremy, just a quick question. I know roughly what I want to achieve in my job, but I'm struggling to define it in a clear way. I didn't know if you had any tips. So I think this is a common problem, Mark, that we all have this idea that we want life to improve, our careers to improve, our health and fitness to improve, but we're not quite sure how to define it. So I'm going to dive into our performance zone library here of about 850 different insights and micro lessons. And the one that I've selected is Stuart Broad. I was really privileged uh, at the end of my cricketing career to be the captain at Leicestershire County Cricket Club. And Stuart Broad came in as the bright eyed uh, young player coming in with so much aspiration. And he's clearly gone on to be one of the world's best ever performers now, certainly one of England's best ever bowlers and test players. So I got a chance to catch up with Stuart last year to ask him about his career and the importance of goal setting in his development. Yeah, I, I have two versions of goal setting, I think. I mean, I th- I've always had a bit of a belief if you look too far ahead in, in your career and the way you want your career to go, then you can take your mind off exactly what is going to get you there, the little improvements that get you there. But at the end of the day, 
you need that sort of shining light at the at the end to to have that excitement every day you know that that buzz you get in your stomach that lighting up of the heart that one day I could lift whether it's the ashes the world cup something that might not feel that real to you at this at this moment in time but it actually makes the the leg press that you have to do on a monday morning like worthwhile and you can see that there's that there is something there for it so I mean, I, I remember as a kid at school, someone said, oh, do you want to play cricket for England? I was like, I don't just want to play cricket for England, I want to win the Ashes. And actually, it's quite a weird thing to say as a 14-year-old kid, because if you ask most kids, they would say, I just want to play for England. But I, I never I never saw that as a, as a massive aim for me. It was actually to win games for England, to actually have success, do things that might not have been done in my childhood. You know, we went through a long period of not winning the Ashes. So maybe that deep down drove something within me that that has to change I have to be part of something that that's different to what it is now and so um, yeah I mean I, I've, I've always set goals that are, are big and like end of the tunnel stuff but I do try to, to remain quite current and what's going to make me better today that will eventually lead me on the, the steps to the ladder to the top. So that's a brilliant insight there. And what's really fascinating is to hear that Stuart Broad held that dream and that vision of what he wanted to achieve for such a long time. As a schoolboy, he wasn't just setting the bar as being a professional sports person or even getting the chance to play for England. This is an utterly transformational goal that's not only going to transform the way he sees himself, but the way the world sees him. So it's got an incredible amount of emotion and inspiration attached to it. And it reminds me of a similar story from Graham Smith, the South African cricket captain, who aged about 12, drew a picture of himself uh, on a piece of paper in a, you know, green uh, kit, cricket kit, and uh, said that he wanted to be the South African cricket captain. And he put that on the fridge, aged 12 years old. And obviously he walked past that fridge every day through his childhood, through his cricket training, through his schoolwork. And that became a focus point for him. So I think... One of the lessons that we can take from the world's top performers about goal setting is we need this truly transformational goal, this inspirational goal. But we don't just need uh, sort of to write it down. We need to feel it. Um, The world's best performers can almost visualize it in technicolor. They can see themselves lifting the World Cup. They can almost feel themselves in that international shirt. Um, They can smell the champagne and they can hear the crowd. They're immersed in that as an emotional connection. So maybe the first thing that we can do when we consider our own um, goals, maybe it's a career goal or a well-being goal. Um, Maybe it's a business goal. So have a think about what that gold medal moment for you or that World Cup moment for you would be. And have a think how it would feel. Would you be at an awards ceremony? Maybe you're selling your business as an entrepreneur and you've got that Uh, you know, world trip, you know, sitting on a beach in Mauritius thinking about, you know, the success that you actually realized your uh, potential and also the sort of financial element of selling your business on. So there's, there's that emotional connection that we need around the dream that suddenly fires us up to get out of bed in the morning and to have something as that guiding light that we can use to guide all our choices as we move through some of the struggles. And it was interesting to hear Stuart Broad talk about the stuff that goes on in the shadows, that, uh, you know, dreary Tuesday morning when he's got to do the leg press in the gym. That's exactly that sort of pit of despair. That's when you need that inspirational light shining on your goal that makes you realize that this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm doing it. So we talk so much about goal setting. So the first part is goal setting. But I'm much more interested in the next stage, which is goal striving. And I think this ability to move from, you know, the high level aspiration into something that sets off a a chain reaction of daily choices uh, and our daily disciplines is going to be absolutely critical. So we've had another, uh, I had a direct message on Twitter from Charlotte with another great question, thinking about how we start to move this into a bit more practical realm. Hi, Jeremy. I've got a long term goal that I know I want to achieve, but I'm struggling on what I need to do in the short term to get there. Have you got any advice? 
So I think this is a common problem that we have this inspirational goal, but it just seems so far away. Maybe it's a three to five, maybe even a 10 year aspiration, as we've just been hearing about with some of the world's best cricketers. So one of the best insights in our digital library, the performance zone to choose here is from Sir Dave Brailsford, who was an incredibly successful head of British cycling in the velodrome with a huge number of medals produced over a decade. But then he went on to have even more success with the Tour de France team, Team Sky and Team Ineos. So in this example, I was fascinated to spend the morning with Sir Dave Brailsford up in Manchester at the velodrome and hear how this gold medal factory, this high performance environment was delivering the psychological environment to deliver those results. So I was expecting everything to be about winning, everything to be about, you know, the the dream of being a gold medalist. But actually, when you start listening to Dave Brailsford's insight, we hear there's much more beneath the surface. I think you've got you've got to differentiate between two things. I think we we like to have outcome driven strategies, so we always want an outcome. But I think you've got to be very careful in terms of um, uh, really clearly understanding what's a dream, what we'd like to happen, and what's a target. Um, let's say Chris Hoy, he wants to win a gold medal, and that's his dream. However, whether that happens or not isn't really in his control. You've got all of the other athletes in the world. You've got a lot of other variables which he can't influence right up until the moment he gets there. But what he can do, he, he can manage everything about himself. So what we, we accept, we all accept we have a dream, that's what we want to happen. But actually we then, ident- then identify targets. We can guess pretty much or figure out rather than guess, um, you know, what's it going to take to be on the podium. We can translate that into uh, a weight in the gym, power that he develops in, in his sprint training, um, tactical awareness, you know, all of those different things you can create targets around. And so we went, we then work to those targets. Now, that'll only give you a performance and it could, you know, fulfil the dream. We think it would fulfil the dream. But if we just set out thinking, right, the goal is winning, then you're in big trouble. From a psychological point of view, you're in big, big trouble. And I think that's, you know, you see it quite a lot in younger athletes where they think, right, my goal is to win. Well, all you can do then is, is pretty much stress yourself out because winning isn't necessarily within your within your control. So we find actually recognising, yeah, we want to win, of course we do, but actually we're going to control our world here. We're going to work to these targets. Then everybody settles down, they stop, you know, they don't agitate as much and they can really get on with the job and the processes of what it's going to take to achieve these things. And if you tick them off, I'm now in the best shape possible to go and try and achieve my goal, and I'm actually going to be feeling good about it. I've left no stone unturned. I feel my belief systems are great. My confidence high. I know what to do. I couldn't be more prepared. I'm in the best possible position to try and achieve my dream. And then what happens, happens. So it's a fascinating insight there from Sir Dave Brailsford. And I was so interested in the lack of talk about winning. I mean, this is one of the most successful sporting organisations in the world. And clearly they jump out of bed in the morning and the first focus is to deliver gold medals. But even though your motivation is so high to be a gold medalist, your control over whether that happens with a four year Olympic cycle is minimal because there are so many things out of your control. So if you can imagine uh, as you walk your dog or you're on a train listening to this podcast, imagine a pyramid or even sketch it out. Whereas at the top of this pyramid, we've got our dream goal, this inspirational goal of being the Olympic champion. But underneath that, the next level down, we need a performance goal. This is where this smart goal setting principle that you've all heard about comes in. We need something tangible. So, for example, in an athletic sense, we might have Usain Bolt's 9.6 seconds becomes our target. That's something that we can clearly identify with. So now we've translated Olympic champion into a number, uh, 9.6 seconds. Now we need to ask, in order for me as an athlete to be able to deliver 9.6 seconds on the level below, what do I need to do tactically, technically, mentally and physically to be able to deliver that? We then break those processes and those key drivers down again. So the physical element would break down into power, flexibility, um, endurance, 
Um, and, you know, the, the endurance then would break down again into an exercise regime, maybe a weight training program, a, far, a cardiovascular uh, exercise, exercise regime, and maybe some, um, you know, nutrition and hydration plans as well. So we start to build down this pyramid and what it's going to take to deliver the next level up. So we know that if I have a, a plan for myself today that I've got to eat certain things, drink a certain amount of fluid, sleep a particular amount, and then I've got to lift these weights and then I've got to be able to um, you know, run these sort of circuit trainings or these endurance sessions, then that is my gold medal day. And those key priorities of three to five things sort of denote this as a gold medal day. So when I've ticked those things off and I'm disciplined and focused around those three gold medal activities, then I know I've had a gold medal day. And if I do that a few days in a row, I can have a gold medal week, gold medal months, gold medal quarters. And it's that ability to tick off uh, those daily disciplines and those daily habits, the consistency around them, which brings this incremental improvement and builds this confidence. So this is where the world of elite sport is moving. So there's a massive focus around the emotion of winning and losing and everything that comes with it. But the things that are in our control are our daily activities and our daily gold medal behaviors. So if we translate that into the business world, if we're in the sales environment, we can imagine our boss comes in and says, OK, you did really well last year. Here's your new sales target. And it's 20 percent up on what we did last year, which is already the best we've ever achieved in our lives. So we can easily get stressed about, you know, being the top of the sort of sales leaderboard in the following year or winning the award for sales. So that's all the emotion. So we need to break that down into something practical, which is the target. And then from the target, from a sales point of view, we follow exactly that same pyramid model, breaking it down to say, how do I achieve this million dollar sales turnover or whatever it might be? And that might be a certain number of products, uh, a certain number of client calls, building trust with the, the customers. And that means we're developing the right solutions for them. Maybe it's uh, understanding the referral network and spending a day a week looking at the referrals and how they can fuel your success and your sales funnel. Maybe it's investing a certain number of hours in the product portfolio and the technical knowledge that gives you that expertise. Maybe there's some time on database or, or contact management, and maybe there's some new business connections that need to be spent uh, some time on. So, so we can see again that we've built, we've broken down from that million dollar target into the daily and weekly activities that create this high performance curriculum. And that's where the mindset of the elite performer should be, where the activities are in our control, not worrying about whether we'll win or lose or whether we'll win the award or not in a year's time. But actually, can I have a gold medal day today? Can I win today? And if I want to win today, W-I-N, I've got to ask what's important now? What's important next? And it's that ability to not be distracted away from these gold medal processes that really defines the great people that I've managed to interview. So I think this is one of the key things that hopefully answers um, Charlotte's question there in starting to break these gold medal attributes down. And it's really the discipline that is the key. You know, we all love these ideas of something inspirational. But if I want to have a six pack next summer and I'm sitting there hoovering up and inhaling cakes and pies in the months before my holiday, it's clearly not going to happen. Um, you know, if I dream about being the head of sales or getting promoted and I'm messing about and, and worrying about the sales target and not actually doing anything practical to chase down leads, then it's not going to happen. So um, I think one of the most important insights is that our performance doesn't rise up mythically to the level of our dreams and aspirations just because we've written it down somewhere. It actually falls to the lowest level of our habits. And that's really where it's in our control to be disciplined, to be focused, to make a real difference. So let's listen now to a different insight. This is from Dr. Tara Swartz, who's one of the world's top neuroscientists. If you love the way neuroscience can be applied uh, into your own performance and into the workplace, then her new book called The Source is a brilliant uh, read. So this is Tara Swart talking about the neuroscience of behavior change, as well as some practical tactics that you can use to start moving yourself 
into that new version that you're looking for? One of the things about understanding how the brain works physiologically rather than just psychologically is that we can really start to put things into place that help people to change behaviour and keep it changed. So what I say as a neuroscientist is that I'm not asking you to do something that is really difficult for you, that's not a habit for you, that's going to be hard work for you every day. I'm trying to get you to the place where that's who you are now. And the way we achieve that is through self-awareness, as any coach would, would aim to do, and then focused attention on the desired behaviour or the behaviour that you want to stop doing. So I say to people in the next month, just notice every time you did, did that you know, behaviour or there was an opportunity for you to do something differently and just report back to me. And then the following month, we would do what we call deliberate practice. So you would actually seek out opportunities to behave in this new and different way. And it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string, because it depends what you're trying to do. But over a certain period of time, the brain would start to form a stronger and stronger pathway around that behaviour and eventually it becomes the default and it's an easy thing to do. All of that is lubricated by a therapeutic relationship. So the brain is the organ of relationships. We're not meant to live alone and do things by ourselves. So if you have a coach or a psychologist or a friend who's going to hold you accountable to changing that behaviour, that is going to make it easier for you to do that. And actually, I'm a big proponent of using technology to do that. So these wristbands that measure your steps or your sleep or apps that you can put in what you've eaten or what your mood is, they can all help you to, to you know, really embed that, that behaviour change sustainably. So again, a fascinating insight. And we start to hear that this behaviour change can't just be done overnight. You know, we see these before and after uh, weight loss pictures where somebody's lost so much weight in, in you know, a, a crazy short period of time. But that's so rare. Um, you know, what what's happened is we've actually put that weight on a spoonful at a time, yet we want to lose it by having this level of intensity and, and sort of, uh, you know, stopping ourselves from eating, you know, anything calorific. And then we expect this transformational change to happen. But we've got to be patient. And we don't need necessarily more uh, inspiration. We, meet, we need more discipline and we need more patience. So we're hearing there from Tara Swart about this self-awareness that's critical to understand, you know, where are these choices being made as I, you know, move into the working environment? What are the triggers that make me stress, that make me react in a certain way? What are the triggers that make me buy the, uh, you know, unhealthy food that comes into the house that I then put on the top shelf of the fridge and grab when I'm feeling a little bit low? We've got to think about the choice architecture that we place around us and understand how that interacts. And we can't just rely on our willpower because, you know, if you're trying to cut down on alcohol and you've got a cold glass of wine or cold bottle of wine or a beer sitting there on the front row of the fridge when you get home, then it's going to be really, really difficult. So you've got to stick it at the other end of the house, out in the garage or somewhere to put that friction of distance between you and that sort of temptation. So creating an environment that makes harder choices, um, you know, harder choices easier for you is really important. One of the strategies that I've learned from one of the, um, you know, ad lifestyle advisors was to set my alarm clock uh, when I'm staying away in a hotel, uh, but actually put my alarm on the other side of the room and put my phone in my running shoes so that my running kit is ready to go. I wake up a bit dreary, get up, and I've got to go across the other side of the room to switch my alarm off. And lo and behold, I have to grab uh, my running kit to move it out of the way to get to my alarm. So that's my trigger. That's my association to get it, get into the uh, running gear and, and make that happen. So we need more of that discipline and that planning, that proactivity to understand the environment that we're going to go into so that we can be successful. So I think one of the other key things is um, understanding that our discipline is the key element. So we shouldn't just be judging ourselves on our progress, but we should be judging ourselves on our discipline. Confidence seems to be one of the key ingredients of this winning mindset that we all crave. But to me, confidence translates into preparedness. And this discipline 
of setting yourself three key priorities, five key priorities every day that are going to deliver you a gold medal day, whether you're in um, whether you're a nurse, whether you're in a sales environment, whether you're in a learning team, whether you're in a rugby team or whether you're in an international Olympian, there will be five things that will sort of mean that you can have a gold medal day today. And it's that discipline and focus around those three or four or five key priorities that will make you feel prepared. And when you feel prepared, you'll feel confident and ready to take on the world. So the reason the Olympians put this discipline in is because they know that the biggest concern they can possibly have is to get to that Olympic start line and not feel ready. So this discipline builds like a muscle. We give ourselves small challenges to take on. Can I be disciplined? Can I eat the right thing here? Can I say the right thing in this meeting here? And we build on that confidence and that starts to build with with each sort of incremental move that we make like a muscle building. And over time, we start to get stronger and stronger. We can take bigger risks and bigger commitments. And that's when we start to see real transformational change take place. So I think, you know, we should judge ourselves by our discipline and not by our the intensity of our desire. One of the other things that Tara Swartz spoke about is that we should use our network to deliver our goals. I think sometimes we, maybe there's a private goal, if it's more of a well-being goal that you want to keep to yourself. Um, maybe it's a career goal that you don't want your peers to know about or your boss that you want to get this promotion. So we tend to keep things to ourselves. But it's interesting to think about the role that a support team can play in helping us to be a high performer. And in this next insight, we're going to hear from Annabelle Croft, who herself was the British number one as a tennis player, but now she's a, an international uh, TV correspondent and presenter. She travels the whole world um, following the, the tennis tours. And in this particular insight, she's speaking about Andy Murray and the role his supports team has played in his success. You know, I've watched Andy since he was about 15 or 16, and it's been incredible to watch how decisive he is in terms of who he picks to come into the team. And it's a very tight-knit team, but he was never afraid to take a new coach and, and take out of them the information that he needed and then dispense with them. It's like, well, I've learned enough from you and thank you very much. I'm now moving on. And he was very young when he was doing that. I'm not sure I could have made those decisions but um, you, know, you could call it ruthless but actually he knew what he needed to learn and he's moved on very quickly and with quite quick succession through a few coaches actually but he clearly felt he'd had enough information and it wasn't moving him on and he needed more I think he's one enormous sponge actually and um, then he's put together this very close team uh, of people that are, are really warm, wonderful individuals, but people who clearly uh, bolster him off the court as well. So his physio, his uh, what, two physical trainers and his hitting partner. Then uh, obviously you know, the team is also his mum and his girlfriend as well. And then agents and managers. It's quite a big team in terms of tennis, but very, very strong unit. And I think he's very, very appreciative of all of you know, the roles that they play within his um, his world. So we tend to think of the world's top individual sports stars as just that. They're sort of going alone, going solo. But when we think about Andy Murray, Rory McIlroy or Serena Williams, it's not just this individual element we should consider, but actually they're the team that they've built around them. They consider themselves as the CEO of their own business and they hire and fire their strategists, their motivators, their masseurs, their medics to get the very best people to both support them and to challenge them to be better this year than they were last year. So maybe that's another principle that we can consider. Who are the people that are going to give us the confidence, the discipline, the focus, uh, the, the sort of ear the, the sort of arm around our shoulder that's going to make a difference to us. So we need to think about spring cleaning that list of friends and even family members that we spend our time around. If there are people that are in your family or your boss that are 
negative and drain your energy. We need to think about how can we take control as the CEO of our own business and start to spend less time in those areas and gravitate more towards the positive, enthusiastic people who've got fresh ideas, fresh thinking, encourage us to take the risks, reinforce our confidence, reinforce our discipline so that we make those healthy, high performance choices that then aggregate on a daily and weekly basis that help us to transform our lives. So maybe have a think again, if you're on a train or you're walking about the five or six people in your dream team. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's a mate from school who makes you laugh and is really positive. Maybe it's an investor in your business or a mentor that can help you about the next step in your career. Who are the people that you're going to surround yourself with in the next six to 12 months that are going to help this tough journey to be eased by their positivity? So I really hope you've enjoyed these insights from today's episode. I hope you found it thought provoking, helpful and mostly that you can do something different as a result of what we've talked about. There's really no secret to creating these high performance habits apart from doing it and making it part of who you are and how you're going to live in the future. Everyone makes mistakes, but if we can aim for this 80 to 90 percent gold medal days with these occasional blips and cheat days, then that's very normal to achieve. I'd love to hear your questions for future episodes of this Inside the Mind of Champions podcast. So please do email them through to me at hello at sportingedge.com or use LinkedIn, Jeremy Snape, Twitter at The Sporting Edge or Instagram. Um, and I'd be delighted to see what your questions are around the topics of mindset, leadership and teams. I'd also love your help in getting this podcast off to a flying start. So please, before you switch off into the real world, leave a review and subscribe. And if you get a chance to share it with anyone that you think could benefit, I'd be absolutely thrilled. When I played for England, there were moments when I felt like I was on my own doing it and I didn't really understand the mindset of these incredible people. So I'm now really passionate about sharing their secrets, sharing this incredible digital library that we've got. So please do keep in touch on the podcast and you can get in touch with more information and see more of our interviews at www.sportingedge.com. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time.